Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is March 14th, and today we're going to look at Exodus 24 through 6. Just a reminder, every day, normally, I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and theology in that chapter. Well, today, we're still in a series going through the Ten Commandments, and so uh, we're going to keep doing that for just a little bit longer, uh, so stick with me, and my goal is still, Lord willing, to get you uh, through all of this episode, every episode, really, in about 5 to 20 minutes every day. So let's look at Exodus 24 through 6. And Exodus 24 through 6 says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God and a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so this is our reading today from Exodus 24 through 6. Now, one reason Roman Catholics have trouble understanding this commandment is they divide the Ten Commandments differently. According to Catholics and also to Lutherans, Exodus 23 through 6 is a single commandment. The prohibition against making idols is part of the commandment not to have other gods. The way they make up the difference is by dividing coveting into two commandments. Now, this raises an important question. Are those who are Reformed correct in recognizing Exodus 24 as the beginning of a new commandment? Well, the answer in my view is yes. Having other gods and and not making idols are two different regulations. The first commandment has to do with worshiping the right God. We must reject every false God in order to worship the true God, who alone is our Lord and Savior and King. The second commandment has to do with worshiping the right God in the right way. We may not worship the Lord in the form of any man-made idol, whereas the first commandment forbids us to from worshiping false gods. The second commandment forbids us to worship the true God falsely. How we worship matters nearly as much to God as to whom we worship. We may not worship him any way we like, but only the way that he is commanded. In the words of the Westminster Shorter Catechism in Answer 51, the second commandment forbiddeth the worshiping of God by images or any other way not appointed in his word. A good illustration of the difference between the first and the second commandments, it comes from the life of King Jehu. The Bible praises Jehu for eliminating Baal worship from Israel, which he did by putting the wicked Queen Jezebel to death in 2 Kings 9, 30-37, and by destroying the ministers of Baal in 2 Kings 10, 18-27. So the account of Jehu's victory, it ends with this commendation in 2 Kings 10, 28. So Jehu destroyed Baal worship in Israel. Well, so far, so good. Jehu refused to worship other gods. But the Bible goes on to say this in 2 Kings 10, 29. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, the worship of the golden calves of Bethel and Dan. And so if Jehu got rid of Baal worship, then what were these sacred cows doing in Israel? The answer is that although Jehu enforced the first commandment, he allowed his people to break the second commandment. The golden calves did not represent other gods. They were intended to represent the God of Israel. But this is precisely what the second commandment forbids, worshiping God with an idol. And whereas the first commandment forbids false gods, the second forbids false worship. In fact, the second commandment is one of the longest in Exodus 24 through 6. It says, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandment. Now, there are four 
four parts of this commandment. The rule, the reason, the warning, and the promise. The rule is very simple in verse 4. Don't make any idols. Or as the King James says to them, graven images, which it also says in Leviticus 26.1. This translation comes close to the original meaning. An idol was something crafted by a tool. Whether it was carved out of wood, chiseled out of stone, or engraved in metal, it was cut and it was shaped by human hands. It was a man-made representation of some divine being. This did not mean that the Israelites were forbidden to use tools, nor did it mean that they were not allowed to produce artwork. Later, when it was time to build the tabernacle, God sent the Israelites his spirit to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and even set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship in Exodus 31, 4 through 5. And so what the second commandment ruled out was not making things, but making things to serve as objects of worship. This is clarified in the second part of the rule in Exodus 25. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Literally means you shall not serve them. The Israelites were strictly forbidden to make images of God to use in worship. Although God appreciates artistry, he will not tolerate idolatry. This rule is clarified with the kinds of idols God forbids in verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. That pretty much covers everything. Nothing in the sky, nothing on the ground, nothing in the sea. In other words, the Israelites were not allowed to represent God in the form of anything in in all creation. And remember that the Israelites have been living uh, with the Egyptians who worship many gods, nearly all of which they represented in the form of animals. The god Horus had the head of a falcon. The god Anubis had the head of a jackal and on and on. And when it came to the Egyptians and their idols, any animal was fair game. But the God of Israel refused to be represented in the image of any of his creatures. Now, there are many good reasons for this rule, but the one God specifically mentions is his love. In verse 4 and 5, he says, You shall not make for yourself an idol. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is the reason for the rule. God forbids idolatry because of his jealousy. To use a more positive and also a more accurate word, it is because of his zeal, the burning passion of his love. Jealousy doesn't get much positive publicity these days. You know, when people talk about it, they generally mean something more like envy, the desire to get something that doesn't belong to them. And yet when something really does belong to you, there are times when it needs to be protected. A holy jealousy is one that guards someone's rightful possession. The most obvious example is a love between a husband and a wife. No husband who truly loves his wife could possibly endure seeing her in the arms of another man. It would make him intensely jealous and rightly so. Well, God feels the same way about his people. His commitment to us is total. His love is exclusive. It's passionate. It's intense. It's jealous. As one commentator explained, godly jealousy is not the insecure, insane, possessive human jealousy that we often interpret this word to mean. Rather, it is an intensely caring devotion to the object of his love, like a mother's jealous protection of her children, a father's jealous guarding of his home. And so if this is what jealousy means, then God has to be jealous. He loves us too much not to be jealous. In fact, jealousy is one of the Lord's divine perfections. What God so jealously protects in the second commandment is the honor of his love. God not only loves us, but he wants us to love him in return. And among other things, this means worshiping him in a way that is worthy of his honor. God has a right to tell us how he wants to be worshiped, and he has commanded us not to spurn his love by turning him into an idol. God's jealousy explains why the second commandment ends with a warning, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me in Exodus 25, and a promise in verse 6, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. See, God shows his zeal to be glorified in our worship by cursing those who break the second commandment and blessing those who keep it. The warning is, is that children will be punished for the sins of their fathers. Now, the word for sin, sometimes translated as iniquity, it refers to something twisted. It suggests that idolatry is a kind of perversion and turning against God. Now, it may seem very religious to worship idols, but since God hates idolatry, according to Deuteronomy 16.22, it is really a way of showing hatred for the Lord. And it is not at all surprising that God threatens to punish those who do such a hateful thing. What some people want 
wonder, though, is whether God's curse is just. How can God judge a person for someone else's sin? Is it really fair to punish children for the sins of their fathers? Now, many scholars, they don't think this is fair. And so they try to do uh, gymnastics, find another way to explain this verse. Some interpret sociologically. And, and so to them, they point out that a father's sin has consequences that can last for generations. They also point out that because children imitate their parents, sin tends to run in the family. One generation sets the spiritual tone for the next. And so perhaps the second commandment is based on universal truths about family relationship. But the commandment, though, says is something more than this. It says that God punishes children for the sins of their fathers. And and what a father passes on to his children is not simply a bad example, but the guilt of a sin. And the principle here is covenant solidarity. God holds families responsible for their conduct as families. The Israelites were in covenant with God. And so when the covenant head of any family sinned against God, his whole family was judged. To give just one example, all 70 of Ahab's sons were killed for their father's idolatry in 2 Kings 10, 1 through 17. And that's not to dismiss or even deny individual responsibility. God holds each one of us accountable for our own sin. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul who sins is the one who will die. The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. God never condemns the innocent, but only the guilty. Here, it's important to notice something in the second commandment that's often overlooked, namely how the threat ends. God says that he will punish three or four generations of those who hate me in verse 5 of Exodus 20. It's not only the fathers who hate God, but also their children. And people who struggle with the fairness of this commandment, they usually assume that although the father is guilty, his children are innocent. But the children hate God as much as their father did, which, given the way they were raised, is not surprising. And so it's fair and just for God to punish them for their sin, for their father's sin. God also promises to show mercy for those who love him and keep his commandments, not to serve idols. The promise is more powerful than the warning because it is its blessing lasts not just for three or four generations, but for a thousand years. In other words, it lasts forever. This was God's promise going all the way back to Abraham in Genesis 17:7, which says, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. All we have to do is respond to the God who loves us by loving him in return. So God's threat in the second commandment may seem discouraging to someone who comes from a family who does not honor God, but God's blessing triumphs over God's curse. And God often intervenes in the history of a family to turn their hatred into love and worship. He does what he did for Abraham. He calls a family to leave its idols behind to follow him. And, and when the Lord does this, he established a lasting legacy. His grace rests on a family from one generation to the next. This is not some kind of automatic guarantee because children are free to turn away from the God of their fathers and mothers. But it is a promise to receive by faith. What is God doing in your family? As, as parents plan for the future, they, they should be more concerned about the second commandment than they are about their financial portfolio. This commandment contains a solemn warning for fathers. You see, when a man refuses to love God passionately and, and to worship God properly as revealed in the word, the consequences of his sin will last for generations. The guilt of a man who treasures idols in his heart will corrupt his entire family, and in the end, they're going to be punished. But a man who loves the Lord supremely, a man who bows before the Lord in genuine worship and serves the Lord with true praise, will see the blessing of God rest on his household forever. So you must ask the question, three questions really. What kind of life are you leading? What kind of worship are you giving? What kind of legacy will you leave? There is a story in the Bible that shows what's wrong with idols. It is set in Athens, a story of Paul and the philosophers. Athens was a great city in those days, the intellectual capital, really, of the world. High on the Acropolis stood the Pantheon, the showpiece of Greek architecture. The streets bustled with commerce. There, there was also a great deal of traffic in the marketplace of ideas. As scripture says in Acts 17, 21, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. 
Athens was full of idols. There were images of all shapes, of all sizes, made of wood, stone, gold, and silver. They represented all the gods and the goddesses and the Greek pantheon. There were so many idols that one Roman writer joked that it was easier to find a god in Athens than a man. And towering over them all was the great goddess Athena, whose statue could be seen 40 miles away. Athens held perhaps the most spectacular display of idols that the world has ever seen. And so when the apostle Paul saw all these graven images, he was provoked almost to anger. The Bible says that he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols in Acts 17, 16. He was disheartened and dismayed to see so many people worshiping so many idols and thus denying God his glory. For days he reasoned with the Athenians, trying to persuade them to turn away from all their false gods in order to worship the one and the true and the living God. He preached the gospel, the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And eventually, Paul came into contact with members of the Erebus, the famous philosophical society that met on Mars Hill. These men were the censors who controlled the religious lectures given in Athens. Now, their society also served as a kind of think tank, something like the Brookings Institute of the American Enterprise Institute. The Erebus included some of the most learned men of the ancient world, men who loved to argue about philosophy and even religion. And so wanting to learn more about what Paul was saying, they invited him to address their assembly. Now, one might have expected Paul to tell the philosophers that they were worshiping the wrong gods. All of their idols represented false deities, and so he might have said, you you shall have no other gods addressing them on the basis of the first commandment. That's not what Paul said, however. It was one of the implications of what he said, but it's not where he placed his emphasis. Instead, he addressed them on the basis of the second commandment. He told them that God cannot be worshipped by way of idols. Their problem was not simply that they were serving the wrong gods, but that they were worshipping the wrong way altogether. And so Paul began this way in Acts 17, 22 through 23, when he stood up and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your object of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. This was a clever rhetorical strategy. By making an idol to an unknown god, the Athenians were trying to cover all their bases. But they were also admitting that there was at least one thing about religion that they did not know. And so the apostle told them that he was there to explain it. And next, Paul said that the creator God is a living spirit who cannot be put in a box in verses 24 and 25 of Acts 17, which says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Paul was clarifying the relationship between the creator and the creature. We do not make God, he made us. We do not give life to God, he gives life to us. And to strengthen this point, Paul proceeded to quote from one of their own Greek poets in verse 28, who said, we are his offspring. Now, the brief doctrine of God had one very obvious implication. If God is the creator and giver of life, then he cannot be squeezed into some man-made idol. How could the transcendent God possibly be reduced to a mere object? And here is Paul's conclusion in Acts 17, 29-30. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So Paul was saying something very important about the second commandment. He is actually saying that when we use idols, we're not worshiping the true God, but we're constructing a false God, a God made in our own image. As Paul later explained in Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. This was the problem with idolatry all along. It created a false image of God that was inadequate to his deity and unworthy of his majesty. God is infinite and invisible. He is omnipotent and omnipresent. He's a living spirit. And so to carve him into a piece of wood or stone is to deny his attributes, the essential characteristic of his divine being. An idol makes the infinite God finite, the invisible God visible, the omnipotent God 
impotent, the all-present God, local, the living God, dead, and the spiritual God, material. In short, it makes him the exact opposite of what the Lord is as revealed in the Word. And so, thus, the whole idea of idolatry rests on the absurdity of human beings trying to make their own image of God. An idol is not the truth, but a lie. It is a God who cannot see, know, act, love, or save. Now, it's tempting to think of idol worship as a thing of the past. And unless we go overseas to serve as missionaries, the only place we're likely to see traditional idols is in a museum. We certainly don't have any idols in the church, do we? Maybe not, if an idol is only something we can see and touch. But like the rest of the law of God, the second commandment is spiritual. It applies to the heart. And in our hearts, we are always busy fashioning God in our own image. John Calvin said that the human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. Rather than worshiping God in spirit and truth, as John 4.24 says, we reshape and we remake him until he is safely under our control. What are some of the ways we manufacture our own gods? You see, we make an idol whenever we worship an image rather than listening to the word. And one of the problems with physical images of God is that they keep us from hearing the voice of God. This is why God did not reveal himself in a physical form on Mount Sinai. Moses said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 16, You saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol. The way God revealed himself at Mount Sinai was not through a visible image, but through an audible word. And this tells us something. It tells us something about what the Lord, how and how the Lord wanted to be worshipped. He does not want us to look, but to listen. Nahum Sarna says, in the Israelite view, any symbolic representation of God must necessarily be both inadequate and a distortion. For an image becomes identified with what it represents and is soon looked upon as the place and the presence of the deity. In the end, the image itself will become the locus of reverence and an object of worship, all of which constitute the complete nullification of the singular essence of the Israelite monotheism. Today, we're living in a visual age. Everywhere we go, we see images flickering across the screen. Some Christian leaders say that the church needs to adapt by becoming more visual in its presentation of the gospel. Instead of simply talking about God, we need to show people something. But this impulse is idolatrous. In his influential book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman writes, In studying the Bible as a young man, I found intimations of the idea that forms of media favor particular kinds of content and therefore are capable of taking command of a culture. I refer specifically to the Decalogue, the second commandment, which prohibits the Israelites from making concrete images of anything. The God of the Jews was to exist in the word and through the word, an unprecedented concept requiring the highest order of abstract thinking. Iconography has become blasphemy so that a new kind of God could enter a culture. People like ourselves who are in the process of converting their culture from word center to image center might profit by reflecting on this mosaic injunction. Indeed, what the image always wants to do in worship is to distract us from hearing the word. The crucifix, the icon, the drama, the dance, these things are not aids to worship, but make true worship all but impossible. And in a visual age, we need to be all the more careful not to look at the image, but to listen to the word. And if you preach the word, that's why we must preach the word with great care and with precision. But we also make an idol whenever we turn God into something that we can manipulate. This was a whole point of pagan idolatry. The Egyptians did not think that the gods actually lived in their idols, but they did think that idols gave them the kind of spiritual contact that would enable them to control their gods. So much contemporary spirituality tries to do the same thing. People are always looking for a more user-friendly God, a God who can be adapted to suit their purposes. They say, if if I do this, then God will do that. If I touch the minister, then I'm going to be healed. If I fulfill my vow, then God is going to make me rich. If I just believe it, if I say the right prayer every day, I'll have the key to unlock the blessing of God. If I follow the right parenting model, then my kids will grow up to be godly. As long as we approach God the right way, we'll get what we want, but God will not be manipulated. When God commands us not to make idols, he is saying, well, will not be captured, contained, assigned, or managed by anyone or anything for any purpose. God wants us to trust him and obey him, not use him. 
And yet we also make an idol whenever we choose to worship God for some of his attributes, but not others. The old liberal church wanted a God of love without justice. And so they denied fundamental doctrines like the wrath of God and the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Now many evangelicals are downplaying the same doctrines. Nearly half of the students of evangelical colleges and seminaries say that talking about divine judgment today is bad matters. Feminist theologians deny the fatherhood of God. They prefer a God who more made in the image of women. Open theists deny the foreknowledge of God, although they say that God knows some things about the future since since he does not know what human beings will decide to do. He doesn't know everything. In effect, these theologians are advocating a deity who thinks more than the way they do, a God who is trying to figure out things that go along. But all of these new theologies really are a form of idolatry. And so when people say, I like to think of God as, they're usually remaking God in their own image. Today, we are tempted to worship God the way that we want him to be rather than the way he actually is. We tend to emphasize the things about God that we like and minimize the rest. We place a higher priority on knowing the Bible than on loving God. We tend to think that God is more concerned with private morality than with social justice. And since we're legalists at heart, we are motivated more by a sense of duty than a deep gratitude for the grace of God. And when we do all of this, we end up with a deity without love, without compassion, or with the grace of God. And so how can we worship God the right way? What can save us from our own private idolatries? Well, the answer is simple. Rather than remaking God in our own image, we need to be remade into his image. God does this by bringing us into a personal saving relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. And here is a deep mystery. When God first created the world, he made men and women in his own image, as we see in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We were made to be like God to reflect his glory. And this is another reason why God tells us not to make image. He already has an image. We are the image of God. As Calvin said, God cannot be represented by a picture or sculpture since he has intended his likeness to appear in us. Or as Christopher Wright has written, the only legitimate image of God is the image of God created in his own likeness. The living, the thinking, the working, the speaking, the breathing, the relating human being, not even a statue will do, but only the human in person. We are not allowed to make God's image, but only to be God's image. So our ability to do this was badly damaged by our fall into sin. The image of God in us has been defaced like so much graffiti on a mirror. In our fallen and sinful condition, we are no longer able to reflect God's glory as he intends. But God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to repair his image in us. Jesus is the true image. Colossians 1.15 and 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Says, the image of the invisible God, the exact representation of his being, as Hebrews 1.3 says. This is why Jesus could say that anyone who sees him has seen God in John 14.9. He is the point of contact. So in order to come to God in true worship, we don't need to make some kind of idol. All we need to do is come to him through Jesus Christ. And when we come to Christ, then God lives in us by his Holy Spirit. He works in us to repair his image so that we can then live for his honor and for his glory alone. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is March 14th, and we've looked at Exodus 24 through 6. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.